In our worship with number 315, 315. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my Lord. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e such love and sorrow meet? All thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Number 300, and then we'll have our opening prayer. <clears throat> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song.
will be led in prayer at this time. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for coming today and joining us as a church. Before we pray, I want to share with you one passage from the scripture. The book of Psalm, chapter 27, verse 10 says, When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Thank you for coming and let your Holy Spirit be with you this morning. Let's bow and pray with me. Our precious Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this morning, Heavenly Father, with thanksgiving and hopes, Father. Thank you for this day, Father. Thank you for your blessings, for your trials that are news every morning. Oh, Lord, thank you for your mercy, for your kindness, for the many blessings, blessings that we have as your children. Father, we ask you to protect our brothers and sisters in the Rugby Church of Christ. We love you, Father. We trust in you. Thank you for your kindness and, and providence. Oh Lord, the honor and glory is for you all the time in our life. Protect us and protect our elders, elders, elderly, our families, and our children. Protect them, Heavenly Father, for any illness that they have or any difficult situation, Father. Thank you, Lord, for, for everything that you do in our life. This is my testimony. I was lost, and you found me, Father. And I was scared. And you cover me. I was walking, Father. And I was scared because I was feeling alone. But you found me. You say in your holy word, don't be alone. I'm with you. I ask you for get a family. And I got family. I ask you for get a wife. And you give me a wife. And also, Father, and you let me survive with my family. And this is my testimony in front of you. And I said thank you for everything. Forgive us, Father, if we make any, any transgression in our life. We put our life in front of you. And thank you for, for the many blessings that we have. And here, and we are here to serve you. And we put our life in front of you. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be here and receive blessings. Open our mind and heart to receive the message. Write your holy word in our mind and our spirit. Let do and practice the fruit of the Holy Spirit that help us to continue living in this life and walking in the light. Thank you, Lord, 
forgive me, strange. Thank you, put, thank you for put words in my mind. This is hard for, for our family and for me to understand the system sometimes, but we know that we are not alone and we put our family in front of you. Thank you, Lord. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our song before the Lord's Supper is number 113, 113. His grace reaches me. Yes, even me. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sent from the Father and it thrills my soul just to feel and to know that his blood makes me whole. His grace reaches me, yes, his grace reaches me, and who last through eternity. Now I'm under his control, and I'm happy in my soul just to know that his grace reaches me higher than the mountains and brighter than the sun it was offered at calvary for everyone greatest of treasures and it's mine today though my sins were as scarlet he has washed them away his grace reaches me Yes, his grace reaches me and will last through eternity. Now I'm under his control and I'm happy in my soul just to know that his grace reaches me. We are at this time going to observe the Lord's Supper, which we're going to remember the suffering of our Savior. We are not passing a plate with the cups, and so if you don't have one, there's some in the back. If you don't have one, you can raise your hand, and one will be brought to you at this time. So... A lot of people don't know, and this is one of the outstanding things that, that I still face on a fairly daily basis, is a lot, a lot of people don't know that there are medical doctors that don't have MD behind their name. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, and I have a DO behind my name instead of an MD. And instead of going to some long history about that, um, I will tell you about the man that started our profession. His name was A.T. Steele, Dr. A.T. Steele. And he was a naturalist. He had grown up out in the plains in the uh, early 1800s and uh, studied nature and um, uh, particularly had a, a keen interest in anatomy. 
that when he hunted for food, he would study the anatomy of the animal that he killed to help feed his family. And he learned about that connection between the anatomy and the way organ systems work. And that had a profound effect on his future as a physician because there was a point where he lost many of his family members due to uh, common illnesses at the time and saw that the traditional treatments of the medicine men not only didn't help but actually caused more harm. And so he thought there's got to be a better way. And so he went back to that inclination toward nature. And what he saw was that there are fundamental principles that govern all of life on the earth, and that violation of any of these principles causes disease. And that the way you remedy those diseases is not by further violations of nature's laws. And he was a spiritual man, and his father was actually a, a circulating Methodist preacher, and so he, he had a, at least a fundamental understanding of the God of the Bible. And he had many great quotes because he was a professor as well and started the College of Osteopathic Medicine. And one of his quotes that always comes up in my mind and, and that I ruminate on often is one where he says, I love God because I can find no contradiction when I examine all of his work. And I think, I don't know if he understands the profound nature of that statement. But that's something that I think about often, is that we can love and trust God because he is not given to contradictions. He is not like many of us in the kingdoms of men that we put our finger to the wind and determine which way we're going to go, and it may be right one day and left the other day. That God is truly the rock of ages. And that when he says something, it stands forever. And therefore, we can trust in him and his promises. That they may beat upon, they may be beat upon by the winds and the seas of time, but they will stand true. And therefore, we can rest firm in our faith that by following his words, that we will not go unrewarded. And that we can put our hands in his trust, even to the point of death, and to do so gladly. And I'm reminded of the covenants of God. In Genesis chapter 9, in the aftermath of the great flood, beginning in verse 12, God lays out the token of the new covenant and the nature of the new covenant that he would not ever again destroy the earth with a flood. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. To this day, when a great rainstorm comes in the aftermath, you can still look up in the sky and see the bow and can be reminded of the everlasting covenant that the Lord your God made with all creatures on the earth, though it was thousands of years ago. The covenant has not changed, because he has not changed. In Jeremiah chapter 31, he alludes to a coming second covenant, a new covenant. 
in which he would make promises that would never be annulled. And in chapter 31, beginning in verse 31, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And what we are honoring this morning is a manifestation, the crucial moment in which that covenant took place, because it took blood to enact that covenant, and it was the blood of Jesus Christ. And I think the point I want to get across is that no matter how many thousands of years will pass, the covenant will still be in effect because God never changes. And so you can trust in him. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, he says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit. That they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. The great thing about God is that he always remembers. And though many, many years from now, many of us in the world certainly will not remember that we were here on this day, September 19th, 2021, but he will remember. And he will remember the time that you opened your heart to Jesus and that you remembered his suffering son. So let us engage in this now, knowing that what we are doing means something and is not being done in vain. You can trust God. Let us pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that we can put our entire trust in you and to know that you stand firm and that you do not waver. And though the seas of time pass around us and the winds blow and beat upon us, as long as we are anchored to you, we will hold fast to your promises. We are thankful for this bread that represents the body of your suffering son on the cross for our sins. And we pray, Father, that as we partake of this bread, that we will do so in a way that remembers and honors him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Our Father, we are so thankful for the blood of your Son that we remember at this time by partaking of this juice. And we understand, Father, that it's not with silver and gold or perishable things that we are redeemed, but it's by the blood of Jesus. We pray, Father, that you will help us to focus in and to honor him as we partake. Again, it's in his name we pray. Amen. Having now concluded the observance of the Lord's Supper, we use this as an opportune time. We will not be passing a plate. There is one at the back. And 
this is a work of the church. We do not ask our visitors to give at this time. Will you pray with me? Dear Father, you have given us so much, far beyond the things that we can even recall, things that are so subtle that we don't even register. But Father, we know all good things come from you. And apart from your good graces, Father, we would have absolutely nothing. And so, Father, we do give back cheerfully. And we pray, Father, that these funds will be used to spread the word of your Son throughout all the world. And pray, Father, that, that they can be a blessing and that we'll honor you. In his name, amen. Before the sermon and before the Bible reading, we'll sing number 286, Wonderful Story of Love. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it, shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you relieve it? Wonderful story of love. Wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, though you are far away, wonderful story of love, still he doth call today. Calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation, wonderful story of love, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love. Jesus provides a rest, wonderful story of love. For all the pure and blessed, rest in those mansions above us. With those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus. Wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love. Please mark your books at 947 for the invitation song. Today's scripture reading can be found in the book of Ecclesiastes, starting at chapter, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 3, starting at uh, verse number 1. Again, that's Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 3, verses 1 through 11. For everything there is a season, and at a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, 
and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Probably take that off. Thank you. There are some biblical principles and concepts that at times I think we can find uh, a little bit difficult to define. Uh, We feel like we have a good grasp, and I think we do, a good grasp of them, but putting their meaning into words and explaining those things to others It sometimes can be difficult. I'm thinking of such biblical truths as propitiation, uh, sanctification, edification, and I'm sure there's some other Asian words (laughs) in there, ending in A-T-I-O-N, that are difficult sometimes. Uh, And I think of, of spiritual ideals even like grace and faith and love. Sometimes it's hard to put into words and tell people what those, those mean. Um, I know the phrase, I, for, I think you've probably heard it before, I hear it a lot, and I, it's probably overused, the phrase, I can't just seem to wrap my brain around that. Have you ever heard anyone say that? But in fact, when it comes to some words, and the particular word that I'm thinking of today that I want to talk about, that word being eternity, It can be difficult at times for us to wrap our brain around the concept, the idea of eternity. That word eternity is expressed in Scripture also by the words eternal, everlasting, and forever. And I think of all the biblical concepts, maybe eternity is is the hardest of all for us to grasp and explain. Of course, the difficulty is that we're trying to understand and explain the infinite and invisible through finite physical brains and eyes. And yet, friends, I want you to understand that God has revealed in Scripture many things that we can, in fact, understand and explain to others about eternity And I want to talk about those things today because understanding and grasping eternity is pretty important because we're all going to experience it. We're all going to experience eternity. There are a number of passages in Scripture, in fact, which define this characteristic of God's nature, that is, His eternal nature. In Deuteronomy chapter. Uh, 33 and verse 27. Moses states, The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Our God is eternal, and His arms that support us are everlasting. In Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, David writes, Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever You had formed the earth, And the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before the world, before the first words of Genesis, God was. And God will always be. Other scriptures define eternity as it relates to the saved. That is, the saved in Christ. In John chapter 10. Verses 27 and 28, notice these words of Jesus. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal, for 
forever life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. In John chapter 4, in verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water, this is Jesus, of course, whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. He's speaking to the woman at the well. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Eternal life. I think you've heard me say this once or twice in the last three months, but in fact, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, you're already, in many senses, experiencing eternal life. But Christ gave His life for us. He saved us from our sins so that our eternity can be with Him forever and ever and ever. You know, through the centuries, many different people from all walks of life have tried to come up with analogies to describe eternity, and you've probably heard some of these. I found this attempt to explain eternity that's adapted from an ancient non-biblical proverb that I think is pretty good. See what you think about this. If a bird were to fly around the earth just once every thousand years and gently rub its wing on the tip of Mount Everest as it flew by, that when the last grain of the earth had been rubbed away by the, the bird's feather, the first second of eternity will not even have begun. There's a family of words in the Greek from the root aeon. And we derive our English word eon from this Greek word, which Webster defines as an immeasurably or indefinitely long period of time. Now, in the Greek, this word aeon, or it's in its often used form of aeonios, it can mean, okay, let me say that again, it can mean, depending on context, it can mean a duration of time that is undefined but not endless. But it's only found in that meaning and that context three times in the New Testament but in at least 54 and perhaps as many as 60 times in the New Testament, that word, and in fact, in all the passages that we have read so far that are about eternity or eternal life, that word is found 54 times, and according to the Greek lexicon, in those contexts, it always means undefined because it is endless. That's what eternity is. In all of these uses, aeon in the Greek is translated by the word, again, eternal, eternity, forever, or for all ages. Forever and ever and ever. Another reason that I, I think we have a difficult time sometimes grasping this idea of eternity is because it is never-ending, as we just established by the scriptures, and our physical world is a closed system. And, and so we think of eternity, um, by and large, uh, we think of eternity in terms of time. We can understand time. And so we use a word like forever, and, and, and we're thinking of time. We're used to, of course, dealing in our daily lives with time that has constraints. Time that has a beginning and an end. And that's not what eternity is about. And yet, that's in our minds, we tend to think of it in that way. Not that it has an end, but that it's about time. And, and, and largely, our, it's because the things we experience have a beginning and an end. The work day begins at a certain time. It ends at a certain time. Well, in theory, anyway, it ends. We have projects, which always have a beginning and a deadline. The day begins and the day ends, and in the morning we start all over again. We may figure out a way to make the daylight last longer, but you know the day is always going to come to an end. Because in this world, time has a beginning and an end. We understand that physical life has a beginning and an end. As was read earlier by our 
our brother Kobe in, in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 and 2. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a beginning and an end, a time to plant, a time to pluck what has been planted. Babies are born, our loved ones pass away. We call this the life cycle, and it starts all over again. We see this in the world all around us. Uh, our flowers and gardens die back. They're beginning to do that. I've been noticing uh, the last few days that there are a lot more yellow and orange leaves on my patio in the back because the leaves are already beginning, we're moving towards fall. I think Tuesday is the beginning of fall, right? September 21st. We understand our gardens die back, they're reborn in the spring, then winter comes and we start all over again. Again, over and over these cycles continue. Days, weeks, years begin and end. That's what time is about. That is what our physical lives are about, again, beginning and end. And so to imagine, to imagine that eternity is never ending, sometimes it just doesn't compute so well in our physical life and mind because of this. It's something out there. It's something out there, and yet so far away, and here's the problem, friends. Unfortunately, we do not think enough about eternity. We need to think much more in our lives daily about eternity. Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that what we must do in order to truly understand eternity is to go beyond the physical and beyond time and look at that part of us which is eternal. That part of us which is made in the image of God, our eternal spirit. I want to take you back for a moment again to Ecclesiastes. Now, in verses 9 through 11, again, that were read a few moments ago, where Solomon makes a very important statement about God and man in eternity. What gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he. God has put eternity into man's heart. Yet they cannot find what God has done from the beginning to the end. But friends, it is God who imprinted, imprinted in our heart eternity. He gave us that sense that there is something beyond this life. We understand that God is spirit. And he is eternal in his nature. We read those passages. We could read many more that describe the eternal nature of God. Again, speaking to the woman at the well in Samaria, Jesus makes it clear in John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship must worship him in spirit and in truth. The great prophet Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. In this use of eternal, Moses is speaking not just about the fact that God has no end. He also means he had no beginning. And that's what Isaiah is saying here. I said, Moses, I meant Isaiah. When God spoke to Moses, I knew Moses was in there somewhere. When God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, he told him to tell Israel in Exodus 3 and verse 14. You know, Moses said, well, you know, he's still trying to get out of going back to Egypt. And he says, well, well, who do I tell him sent me? This is what God said. You know these powerful words. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And that verb I am in the Hebrew means is, was, and always has been. God is is not the great I was or the great I will be. He is the great I am from eternity to eternity. And it is God who placed within us eternity in our hearts. God put it there, friends. It is something that we can and should and must examine. 
to the stand and share with others. The same Moses records in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. You know these words. You've read this story many times. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Well, friends, since we have established, and you know that God is a spirit, God is not made of flesh and blood and bone like we are. We know and understand that God is a spirit. If God is spirit, then that which is made in his image, that which is made in his image, has to be spiritual in nature. It cannot be the physical part of us, but in fact, it must be the spirit that he gave to us. Notice how the prophet Zechariah describes this in Zechariah 12 and verse 1. The oracle of the Lord, of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. God gave us in his image an eternal spirit. A spirit that will live beyond this life. A spirit that will in fact live forever. He has placed eternity in our hearts. This physical body dies, goes back to dust, but the eternal spirit and the image of God lives forever. But here's the catch, friends, and this is important. In fact, using the word catch just doesn't seem to meet the importance of this. God has given us all a spirit that will live forever, either with God in heaven or in eternal punishment but it will be forever. Make no mistake about it. There is a part of us that is eternal. And you see, God's eternal nature, again, is not defined by time at all. And so we have to step out of our physical nature and think about this in spiritual terms. He, God is outside of time. God created time. I realize He created us to have time in this physical closed world that we live in. But notice it says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created. There is the beginning of time as we know it in our physical world. God made it when he created every element of the universe. This world, this creation had a beginning and it will have an end. The New Testament is clear about that. Jesus is clear about that. Peter wrote extensively about that, that this world is going to come to an end, but not not our eternal nature, our eternal spirit. And so Peter can write in his second letter in chapter 3 and verse 8, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Because God's not controlled by time. God is outside of time because he is the creator of time. But friends, Again, Peter is clear, as I said a moment ago. Christ will come again. And this world and all of its constraints, including time, the physical elements of this world and time itself, will end. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Isn't it interesting that a lot of people today spend a lot of time trying to figure out when the Lord is coming again? The Lord is coming again when God is good and ready. But friend, don't ever forget, the Lord is coming again. And eternity is real. And where we spend our eternity is crucial. Yes, one day Jesus is coming. And Peter says, Again, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will pass away with a roar. And the earth and the heavenly bodies will be burned up. Our universe will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. 
Yes, Jesus is coming back, and when he is, everything in this physical world will end. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53, Paul describes that when Christ comes again, we will all be changed, all of us, the dead and the living. Those who are dead, those who are alive, will all receive a new body, a spiritual body ready for eternity. And so he writes, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Imperishable, immortal, for eternity. That's what it's about. But let me say again, friends, those who are going to be lost for eternity are also going to be given an imperishable, immortal body to spend, to spend eternity in punishment. Friends, my point is this. When Christ comes and this physical world is destroyed, time will not mean anything to us anymore either. So I want to challenge each one of us to think about eternity not based on how long it will be, but rather on where we will spend it because that's the only thing that matters. Yes, it will be forever. Where will you spend your eternity? Now, some of you are old enough, some of you in the crowd are old enough to know this name. I didn't know this gentleman. I think he probably had passed away before I was even born, but I know his music. It's in our psalm book. His name was Brother Killett S. Tedley. Any of you heard of Killett S. Tedley? He was one of the great, great hymn writers in our brotherhood. And he wrote these words that are still so true. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be or what will it be? What will your answer be? Well, friends, I think we spend too much time thinking about eternity in terms of time. It's outside of us, but it is real. We're all going to experience it. Let me say again, the New Testament is clear. There are two choices for eternity. There is eternal life. There is eternal death and punishment. Friends, there's no middle ground. There is no middle ground. Speaking to his apostles and disciples, as well as us, I'm convinced, in Luke chapter 18, verses 29 and 30, Jesus stated, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Oh, Jesus asked a lot of us, I know. But what he promised us is eternal life. Nothing this world has to offer even comes close. Not even close. In his prayer to the Father on behalf of his disciples, recorded in John chapter 5 and verse 24, uh, Jesus, rather, uh, not his prayer, but rather speaking to the crowd. I think I changed that up and forgot to change it in my notes. In John 5, 24, I I originally was going to, quote from John 17, but in John 5, 24, Jesus told the crowd these words, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him, that is God who sent me, has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. You see, he says, whoever hears my words and obeys them, who obeys my father, who listens and does what my father says, he has eternal life. I like that. You notice that's in the present tense? He has eternal life. He doesn't come into judgment. That is the judgment of of hell. But it's passed from death to life. Jesus always made it clear that just as there is eternal life, there is eternal death and punishment. He talked a lot about that, friends. He talked as much about that as he did about heaven because he doesn't want anyone to find themselves there in eternity. Matthew chapter 18, verses 8 and 9. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Friends, there's no example in the New Testament that any Christian ever cut their hand off or plucked their eye out. But you understand what Jesus is saying here. Because this physical body, in the end, yes, we should take care of it. Yes, it is given to us by God. And we should do our best to take care of it. But in the end, it won't matter. 
Because this body's not going into eternity, but we are. We are. And we want to spend eternity with Christ and God and hold Him. But it is so true, and Jesus wants us to understand that there is another eternal death in addition to eternal life. The great religious writer C.S. Lewis said, There are two kinds of people, those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, All right, then have it your way. Tragically, many people will have to endure eternity without God and end punishment. It's not just about being separated from God. Of course it is. But it's also about eternal punishment, eternal punishment, because they chose to live without Him. They'll live eternity without him. We don't want anybody to be in that condition, do we? Another writer has stated, when you fully comprehend that there is more to life than just here and now, and you realize that life is just preparation for eternity, you will begin to live differently. You will start living in light of eternity, and that will color how you handle every relationship, every task, and every circumstance. Certainly that is true. Friends, there is one thing that I can tell you about eternity with the utmost certainty. Eternity is. It isn't about how long it is. It's forever. But it's about that it is. And again, the question to you this morning, for all of us, every one of us here this morning, watching on the internet, where will you spend your eternity? Because there's not any other question that's more important than that. Where will you spend it? Friends, if you're not yet, in Christ Jesus, then you're not ready for eternity. If you've not yet, through faithful obedience to the gospel, given up your sin, given off to Christ, oh yes, we still live our lives in this world, but we live always, first of all, for Him. Through believing that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, being willing to repent of your sins, the Scripture says, and willing to confess Him as Lord and Savior, and then being willing to die to self, to be born again with Him by being baptized. Could God have chosen a better way to explain to us what, what we need to do and what our, our death and life in Christ is about than baptism, which is a burial in water, just as Jesus was buried and rose again from the dead. We are buried with Christ into His death so that God can and will raise us to new life. Friends, only then are we ready for eternity. And it may be that you're here this morning and you're not ready for eternity. Please don't leave here. Don't leave here in that condition. Give me an opportunity, our elders, an opportunity to talk to you and, and share the gospel with you. If you're watching on the Internet. You'll, you'll see a slide at the end of the service this morning with information on how you can contact us. Please do. But friends, for all of us who are in Christ Jesus, you know what's coming next, right? Are we living every day recognizing that we are eternal creatures and we are going to spend eternity somewhere and we want it to be with God? As Christians, we must live every day with eternity. Eternity, not just in our hearts, but in our minds. Because it's the most important thing. If we can help you in any way this morning, won't you please stand with us and let's pray. Praise the Lord, glory to 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 Calling today, calling today, Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today, Jesus is calling the weary to rest, calling today, calling today, bring him thy burden and thou shalt be blessed. He will not turn thee away, calling today, calling today, 
Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is waiting, oh, come to him now. Waiting today, waiting today. Come with thy sins at his feet, lowly bow. Come and no longer delay. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Jesus is pleading, O oh, list to his voice. Hear him today, hear him today. They who believe in his name shall rejoice. Quickly arise and away. Calling today, calling today. Jesus is calling, is tenderly calling today. Please be seated. Our closing song is a number 307. If you'll turn to that, then we'll be led in prayer. 307. <clears throat> Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my breast. But sweeter far thy face to see, and in thy presence rest. No voice can sing, no heart can frame, nor can the memory find. A sweeter sound than thy blessed name, O Savior of mankind. O hope of every contrite heart, O joy of all the meek. To those who fall, how kind thou art. How good to those who seek. Jesus, our only joy, be thou. As thou our prize wilt be. Jesus, be thou our glory now and through eternity. For anyone who's here visiting with us this morning, thank you for joining us this morning. For anyone online who's visiting with us, we thank you for also joining us this morning. After this, we'll have a slide up with contact information for the, the church building here with email and phone numbers. Feel free, any questions about the clear choices that Rayford has left, uh, laid out this morning. Everyone would love the opportunity to help me answer those for you. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Dear God, we thank you for bringing us here together today, this morning, to uplift and edify one another, God, to study a portion of your word and to, to join with you around the table. God, we're grateful for this family you give us here in Rockville. Help us to be a beacon of light to the community around us, God. Help us to be that same to each other here, here within our family. God, as you go with us throughout the rest of this week, God, help us to show others you through our lives for your presence in it. Be with us for the rest of this day and in all that we do. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat>